What's up everyone, Big Dan here, and in this video we're going to be doing the Ultimate Dragon Age Companion tier list. Now, this list doesn't include every single companion that's ever appeared in the Dragon Age franchise. We are going to be skipping over some of the red shirt characters and characters who only appear very briefly in obscure appearances. But for the most part, we're going to be covering the bulk of the characters that show up in Dragon Age Origins, Awakening, Dragon Age 2, and Inquisition. So without further ado, let's dive into the tier list. So, for starters, we're going to be talking about Alistair. Now, initially, Alistair didn't really resonate with me, surprisingly. I kind of found him a little bit annoying initially. I found that he complained a lot, didn't really want to take on any responsibility, and overall just kind of seemed a little bit whiny initially. But eventually, that British charm won me over a bit, and, you know, Alistair became one of my favorite characters in the franchise. I feel like in many ways, Alistair is one of the defining characters of the whole trilogy. So to me, Alistair's an obvious S tier. I really think his, I do think Alistair has one of the most interesting backstories in the franchise, especially when you factor in the novels, which reveal who Alistair's true mother is. I do have a video on that, which I'll link up in the description if you want to check that out. But yeah, Alistair's the S tier, man. Number two, Morgan. Of course, again, this is another S tier character. I feel like that is an easy win for that. I mean, for many people, Morgan is their favorite character in all of Dragon Age, and it's not hard to see why. And Morgan's just one of those characters that's always got a little bit of mystery to her. She's always got a little bit of sass as well, and she's always scheming in the background, so you don't really know what her ultimate plans and motives are at the end of the day. Can you trust her? Is she fully on your side? But she's one of the more dynamic and interesting characters, and... Also, just owing to the fact that she kind of grew up on her own with her mother, isolated from other people, really see in Dragon Age Origins how she's just kind of learning how to interact with other people and build up basic social skills that um, are kind of obvious to people who, you know, grew up in a society. Uh, things like being polite and trying to get along with other people uh, don't come naturally to Morgan. I think that that's kind of interesting to see her grow as a character over the course of the games. Next up, we've also got Dog from Dragon Age Origins. Um, it's a dog. I mean, everybody loves dogs, right? Um, I wouldn't put Dog in the S tier because, I mean, there's not a whole lot to the character. It's a dog after all. <laughs> um, I'm sure dog lovers would obviously put this character in the S tier, but, you know, it's a, it's a friendly dog. We'll put, him in the, we'll put him in the A tier. Next up, we've got Liliana. And this is, again, following along these same lines, this is another S-tier character for me. Uh, Liliana's probably, I'm actually going to slide her above uh, Alistair and Morgan there. And we'll actually probably put Morgan ahead of Alistair as well. Um, I gotta say, Liliana's probably my favorite, or at least one of my like top two or three favorite characters in all of Dragon Age. Um, I really like her whole backstory of how she came from Orle and was involved with the bards and spies there and then joined the Chantry later on and um, really just has a very interesting character arc over the course of the games. Also becoming the spy master for the Inquisition in Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, yeah, I just absolutely love Liliana. I think she's one of the most interesting and fun characters in the trilogy. Uh, next up we have Sten. Now, uh, Sten's a little bit more of one of those, like, stoic characters. Uh, if you watch the tier list that I did on the Mass Effect trilogy, uh, you might remember me saying that those types of characters who are a little bit more stoic and don't show off that much emotion, other than maybe, like, sadness or anger, that sort of thing, they don't really resonate with me all that much. I like the characters who either display a lot more layers and dynamic range of emotions. Um, I think it's a cultural thing in terms of, you know, Sten being a Kunari and growing up in the Kuhn. But, you know, obviously if you compare Sten to Talus or Iron Bull, there's a lot more personality in those characters than there is with Sten. I think Sten is your more stereotypical Kunari. And so he is an interesting character in that he gives us a window into the Kunari that we don't really see initially. He's really the only Kunari we come into contact with in Dragon Age Origins. So it's not until DA2 and Inquisition that we get to interact with more Kunari characters and learn more about them. 
At the end of the day, though, I just don't resonate with him as much. And I'm going to put him in the B tier again. I do think he's interesting in the fact that he really gave us the, our introduction to the Kunari and their culture and ways. Um, otherwise, I would probably put him in the C tier, to be honest. But at the end of the day, I'll put him in the B tier because he does have a little bit of an interesting background. Next up, we got Wynn, the mage grandmother. I'm going to be honest. I don't really care for Wynn as a character at all. I don't know. There's something about her that just uh, grates on me. I think she has that air of superiority, being an elder, kind of like, you know, talking like a know-it-all, like she knows better than you because she's older and wiser and all that shit. Uh, that kind of stuff really bothers me. I mean, you know, I do believe that, you know, older people can, in certain instances, you know, share more wisdom or have something very valuable to share with the younger generation. But when people use their age as a as a way to, you know, flex, for lack of a better term, in terms of uh, flexing in life experience, let's say, I just don't like that. Um, and she does that a lot to the warden in DAO. She kind of like, you know, lectures him or her about certain decisions they make and ultimately i am a little bit miffed that you know she told me not to romance liliana when i was playing this game early on and the same thing i think in my first playthrough i romanced uh morrigan and she disapproved of that how dare you win fuck you grandma you're at the bottom of the list <laughs> all right so next up we got zevran um Zevra was a character who also kind of um, annoyed me a little bit initially. I thought he was just um, kind of a fuckboy. And let's be honest, he, he is kind of a fuckboy. But he's got a little bit of a, a charm and interesting background to his character as well. Um, so Zevran grew on me over time. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, not really going to be one of my favorite characters of all time. I just think he's he's kind of in the middle of the road when I look at him compared to everybody else in the franchise. So um, I'm going to slot him just ahead of Sten in the B tier. I think that that's a good spot for Zevran to be in. So next up, we got Ogren. Um, Ogren's kind of funny. Um, he's kind of a dumbass, too. And... I don't know. He's he's all over the place. He's very impulsive. He's a drunk. Uh, he makes bad decisions. He can also be kind of just gross at times in, some, in terms of some of the comments he makes, some of the sexual comments he makes. But he's also pretty funny, and he's always my frontline tank for the most part when I play Dragon Age Origins. Unless my main character is a like a sword and shield warrior, I always put uh, Ogren in my squad. Um... Overall, in terms of other characters, I do think um, some of his backstory that comes out even more in the Awakening DLC, um, in terms of his like relationship with Felsi and whatnot, can be interesting. But again, you also see that he ends up being a bit of a deadbeat father in that DLC as well. So um, he's not really a good guy overall. He's kind of funny, and he's, he was kind of intended as comic relief, and he does play that role sometimes, but... I don't know. I think he's still kind of like a B-tier character. There are times that I like Ogren, uh, but there's also times where I feel like he's a little bit uh, grating. So I'm still going to put him ahead of Zevran. I do. Um, I think I just have more of an affinity for Ogren because he usually plays the tank role for me in DAO. But at the end of the day, uh, not the best guy. So next up, we have Shale, who's a DLC companion in Dragon Age Origins. Uh, Shale's pretty cool. I like Shale a lot. It's a, it's a golem, um, somebody who was previously a dwarf and then converted into a golem uh, by Keridin, I believe. So she has a pretty interesting connection to Keridin and that whole quest line as well. Also just, you know, pretty funny in terms of her interactions with the Warden and some of the other companions in the game. I like Shale a lot. So I'm actually going to put Shale up in the A tier, put her ahead of Dog. And uh, yeah, Shale's, Shale's a cool character. So next up we have Anders from uh, the Awakening DLC. So... So I'm actually going to judge Anders twice in this video. We're going to first look at his Awakening version, and then we'll look at Dragon Age 2, because the character shifts quite a bit, and I think each version of the character ends up in a different tier for me. So for starters, let's talk about Awakening. Now, in terms of personality and, like, fun, 
the Awakening version of Anders is my favorite. Um, I really like Anders in Awakening. He's hilarious. You know, he has a pet cat. Lovable guy, fun guy, just really wants to be free of the Templars uh, overruling his life. Ultimately, I do think the Awakening version is not as layered or interesting overall as Dragon Age 2, but in terms of the person I would want to hang out with, Anders in Awakening is better. Now, I am going to edit this picture in here in post, I think, but we're going to put Anders in the A tier of the list. Um, so next up, we have Nathaniel Howe, who shows up during the uh, Origins Awakening DLC. I like Nathaniel Howe. I, I think he's an interesting character. Um, obviously, he was not fully aware to, uh, to the extent of his father's crimes and, you know, kind of comes to, you know, learn about his family's background, how his grandfather was in the Grey Wardens, gets to reconnect with his sister. And, you know, obviously, initially, his role in coming to Vigil's Keep was to, like, steal back some of his family's belongings and perhaps get revenge on the hero Ferelden who killed his father. But it, when he comes to learn that, you know, Rendon Howe was kind of a bad guy, it, it kind of tips his world upside down. And I find that uh, Nathaniel's character arc over the course of Awakening, although very short, was quite interesting. He does also make a brief appearance in Dragon Age 2 as well, and then you pretty much don't see him after that. Um, but even if we were just to look at his appearance in Awakening, I think he's a very interesting character, and I would slot him up here in the A tier as well, putting him above uh, some of these other Origins characters. So next up, we have Velana. Uh, what can I say about Velana? She's kind of annoying. <laughs> She's kind of annoying. I, I don't know. I don't really care for Velana. Obviously, she had some misconceptions about what happened to her sister and was taking revenge. She's very standoffish the first time you meet her and, you know, also just kind of has maybe a little bit of a superiority complex. I just don't like her. She's annoying. And, uh... Doesn't really get a whole lot better over the course of the DLC, to be honest. Just like when I'm going to put Velana in the D tier. Um, I'll actually put her below. You know, I'll put her a little bit above Win. Next up, we have Sigrin. Sigrin's kind of interesting. She's a little bit of a morose character. I mean, she's obsessed with death. She talks about death a lot. Being a part of the Legion of the Dead, that kind of makes sense. Basically, any dwarf who joins the Legion of the Dead is basically resigning themselves to death, going into the deep roads, fighting Darkspawn, and that's kind of what she's doing. And so she's really like fixated on this idea of death and dying a good death. But at the same time, she's absolutely terrified of it and I think puts on this front to kind of cover up for the fact that she's, you know, really afraid to die, as many people are. I like that aspect of her character. She's also very interested in learning more. She, you know, gets obsessed with, you know, getting hand getting her hands on some books and learning more. Overall, I would I would probably put Sigrin in the B tier. We'll, we'll put her ahead. We'll put her uh we'll put her just below Ogren. Um I think if if we would have had some more time with this companion or maybe if she would have made an appearance uh later on, um, might be able to rate her even higher uh, if she got some more character development in there because there was some interesting stuff to work with, but at the end of the day, uh, we get such a limited time with her that it's hard to put her above B. So next up, we have Justice. Oh my God, what can I say about Justice? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> well, he's a spirit, and he ends up being kind of a creepy spirit in uh, Origins Awakening. So he... Gets trapped in, we'll just call it the real realm instead of the spirit realm. He's not in the Fade anymore. Uh, comes into the real realm and uh, ends up, you know, inhabiting the body of a recently deceased Grey Warden named Kristoff. And then decides, hey, I'm going to go visit that guy's wife. And really ends up creeping her out. And then if you read his end slide... He goes back to that dude's wife and then just drops dead in front of her. Like, how fucked up is that? How traumatizing must have that been for that woman? 
It gets worse in Dragon Age 2. It gets worse. Pretty one-dimensional milk toast character overall. Uh, he's just all about justice, whatever the fuck that means to him. Um, you know, I guess terrorism, if we were to believe DA2. I, I think he's just kind of a middle-of-the-road character. We're going to put him in the C tier. So now we're on to Dragon Age 2. So next up, we've got Bethany. Oh, Bethany's a sweetheart. Everybody loves Bethany. She's just a nice apostate mage on the run. Um, and, you know, she's very supportive of Hawk and a very nice uh, character overall. I like Bethany a lot. Um, I don't think she's super interesting enough to put her in the S tier or anything like that, but I would give her solid A. I'm actually going to put her ahead of Shale. Um, Bethany's great. Uh, you know, no one should harm Bethany. There is a very bad ending in Dragon Age 2 where if you side with the Templars and Bethany is still a circle mage, you can actually kill her, which is really fucked up. So don't do that unless you're going for one of those really awful playthroughs like I like to do. Um, I've never even done that. I've done some pretty evil stuff in the Dragon Age games and I've never killed Bethany. Um, maybe we'll do a video on that in the future though. But yeah, Bethany's A tier for me. So next up, we have Carver. Oh, man. Carver is that, like, moody brother. My first playthrough of Dragon Age 2, I played as a mage. I always like playing as mages in these games. And, yeah, I, I thought he was really annoying. But, you know, um, he ended up dying for me in the first playthrough because I didn't know if you bring him to the deep roads, he ends up dying. Um, obviously, there's, there's alternate paths there. I mean, if Anders comes to you with the deep roads as well, uh, you can make... Carver a Grey Warden. Same thing goes with Bethany. And then if you don't bring Carver to the Deep Roads, he ends up becoming a Templar. And that's what happened to me on one of my most recent playthroughs. And I actually came to appreciate Carver a lot more, especially going to the background of how he was named. Um, his father basically named him after a friendly Templar that he met. Um, and his father, Malcolm, obviously was a mage character. So that ended up kind of becoming a significant part of his identity and his uh, desire to kind of make a name for himself and grow out of his brother or sister's uh, shadow, grow out of Hawk's shadow. So I ended up liking Carver quite a bit after that. And I'm actually going to put him in the A tier. We'll put him, uh, we'll put him just below the dog. <laughs> Put Carver below the dog. He's ornery. <laughs> Carver's very ornery, but also you can forge a better relationship with him. You're not destined to be rivals with, with Carver, although you probably will end up on the rival path. Um, it is possible to develop better a better relationship with him over time and have better interactions with him depending on what choices you make and what dialogue choices you make when you're interacting with him. So um, he's not always ornery, but... For the most part, he is. Uh, next up, we've got Aveline. Um, I like Aveline. I like her. I think she's a good character. Um, captain of the City Guard. She's a little bit too stuffy at times, um, but I do think her her romance arc uh, with Donic is kind of cute, and it's kind of funny uh, just seeing how you know incompetent she is at dating and how much she struggles to get back into it. Uh, you can kind of have some fun with that as Hawk and, and, you know, pick some of those sarcastic dialogue options and really have a lot of fun with her quest line. But at the end of the day, she's she's really loyal to her friends and really wants to step up and do what's right for the city and what's right for enforcing justice and also sticking up for her friends. So, um, yeah, I like Aveline a lot. I think she's a great character. Um, this is going to be a trend, I think, with Dragon Age 2. I'm actually going to slot her ahead of the dog and we'll put her... We'll put her um, just below Bethany, I think. This is going to be a running theme with DA2. Uh, DA2 has some pretty damn good characters for the most part. Um, I don't love all of them, but, but a lot of them are actually pretty good. And it's one of the things that I think a lot of people who are soured on Dragon Age 2 overlook when it comes to that game. If you really pay attention to the character plot arcs in Dragon Age 2, a lot of them are deeper than many of the other characters characters in the trilogy. With that in mind, we're going to look at Varric now, and man, Varric is the real homie. I look at Varric as the Garrus Vicarian of the Dragon Age trilogy. He's really, um, 
he's he's there good times bad times he's he's your he's always got your back whether it's hawk or the inquisitor he's always there and i think he's a hilarious character he's always got great stories obviously being ha with having that flair for writing yeah man i i always love bringing varick in my squad in da2 and inquisition because he has such funny banter such interesting insights and yeah man i just always always like what varick has to say um I'm going to put Varric in the S tier. I think he's an obvious S tier character. I'm actually going to slot him ahead of Morgan. And man, you know what? When I think of it, I'm putting him ahead of Liliana too. Hey, man. Varric's one of my favorites out there. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where he ends up by the end of this list. Because I haven't thought about this in advance. But as I'm comparing these characters... You know, I'm really thinking, like, who is my favorite Dragon Age character? Let's find out together. Um, so next up, we've got Anders. So this is going to be the Dragon Age 2 version of Anders. Um, okay. Like I said, I think the Awakening version of Anders is the one I'd like to hang out with. I think he's funnier. He's more fun. That being said, from a character and writing standpoint, I kind of think the Dragon Age 2 version's the most interesting one. Especially because, considering how big of a role he plays in the plot in Dragon Age 2, particularly with the finale of the game and, you know, the big boom, he just has such an interesting backstory and how he comes to that decision to, you know, basically blow up the Chantry in Kirkwall and, and how you never really know, like, how much of this influence and decision was made by Anders and how much of it was made because he is possessed by the spirit of justice. It's it's never really clear, and they leave that up to interpretation. Um, it's not even clear to Anders. And, you know, depending on where you are on the friendship and rivalry spectrum, you're going to get different answers from Anders about what really happened. If you're 100% rival with Anders, he says that he corrupted justice into a spirit of vengeance. Um and, you know, you get a different answer from him if you're 100% friendship. So at the end of the day, you know, because of the central role he plays in the plot and how that those actions that he took at the Chantry have ripple effects into Dragon Age Inquisition and just his overall character arc um, coming from Dragon Age Origins Awakening and seeing how much he changed from that, I think he's a better overall character in terms of what's more interesting in Dragon Age 2. So, when I put that into consideration, I'm going to put Dragon Age 2 Anders in the S tier, um, which may come as a surprise to some of you. Next up, we have Meryl. Um, I really don't know how I feel about Meryl. I kind of find her annoying. I don't know. There's something about her that just rubs me the wrong way. She can be really sweet, but she's that really sweet, lovable blood mage, right? You know? And she's so blindingly obsessed with the Alluvians and using whatever means necessary to, you know, restore Elven legacy, whatever the fuck that means. She's also very awkward interpersonally, but unlike Morrigan, she grew up around people, so you would think that she had some better form of socialization. I don't know. I guess because of her obsession with the Luviens and blood magic, she's kind of an outcast among her clan. I understand why a lot of people would love this character, but for me personally, I find her to be a little bit grating and annoying. Nonetheless, I do think her sort of loyalty missions in, in Dragon Age 2 are interesting. And in my most recent playthrough, I kind of went more on the rivalry side with her. So she did not like Hawk. And those interactions were actually really interesting. Seeing how angry she could get was kind of funny and kind of interesting um so with all that in mind i'm actually going to put her in the b tier we're going to slot her ahead of uh sigrin um i'm going to put her ahead of ogren too actually so next up we have fenris uh this is another character who has a lot of fan favorites has a lot of characters who uh romance fenris and have you know their crushes on fenris I'm not one of them. I find him to be a kind of like broody, annoying, um, 
ma- a broody, annoying elf character who hates mages. I think part of the reason that I have a little bit of a bias against Fenris is because I played as a mage the first time around. So yeah, obviously Fenris takes issue with mages. You could still develop a decent um, friendship or a rivalry with Fenris, even as a mage character. And, you know, I think his backstory, you know, warrants a little bit of hatred towards mages. You know, at the end of the day, not my favorite character. I will put him in the B tier. I'm actually going to slot him ahead of uh, Meryl. I think I like him a little bit more than Meryl, but not my favorite. Next up, we have Isabella. Now, Isabella first appears in Dragon Age Origins, and her character model changes quite a bit between Origins and Dragon Age 2. The first time I played Dragon Age 2, I didn't even recognize that this was a character that had already appeared in the franchise. (laughs) It's how different she looks. Funnily enough, she makes a joke like that to Alistair, uh, which I think was kind of a tongue-in-cheek reference to how much some of the character models changed between games, Um, because Alistair looks quite different in Dragon Age 2 compared to Origins as well. They just didn't nail the character models between games with some of those characters. But in any case, Isabella's great. I love Isabella a lot. She can be a little bit conniving and out for herself, um, as a typical roguish character is wont to do. Um, but she's so fun. She's just such a fun character. Ah, oh man, I want to put her in S tier. You know what? Fuck it. Isabella's S tier. I was gonna, before I made this video, I was thinking that she was probably A tier, but man, I love Isabella. I'm gonna put her in the S tier. We'll actually slot her ahead of, uh, (laughs) our Dragon Age 2 Anders. But yeah, Isabella's great. S tier for me, bro. Next up, we have Sebastian. Um, oh my god. This is like, Sebastian is like that super fucking annoying trust fund kid. Uh, I, I don't know. I do not like Sebastian. I do think it's kind of hilarious. If you really closely pay attention to the cutscenes in Dragon Age 2, you'll see how tacked onto the game he is. He's a DLC companion, so he's kind of shoehorned into the game. He will like chime in in cutscenes and like none of the other characters will acknowledge his existence because he was like tacked on after the fact, I guess, in development. But in any case, I don't know. I just think he's so fucking annoying. And uh, I'm going to put Sebastian in the D tier. The thing that really grates me is if you decide to spare Anders, he just like walks off in a huff and he's like, I'm going to bring all of my armies to Kirkwall and smash the city. It's like, bro, are you fucking kidding me? You're going to terrorize the city to like satisfy this personal grudge and sense of justice to kill Anders. Like you're really willing to march literal armies on this city just to kill one guy, you're a fucking idiot, bro. I, I don't know. I just do not like Sebastian at all. So he goes to the D tier. <laughs> I got a little bit heated on that one. Anyhow, next up we have Cassandra. Um, Cassandra is another one of those characters who, at a surface glance, can just be kind of like uh, broody and maybe a little bit grating and annoying. But she has a very deep and layered backstory, especially if you go in and do a romance with her, which I did on one of my most uh, recent playthroughs, even though I think I did break that romance off for the uh, worst playthrough of Dragon Age Inquisition video. You know, juxtaposing her against Sebastian, for instance, um, you know, Cassandra came from a wealthy family in Navarro and ends up kind of resenting the rest of her family, you know, people who were basically, you know, trust fund kids, essentially, who are like, you know, inherited their wealth and feel this sense of superiority and whatnot. Like, she doesn't have any of that. And she decided to go chart her own path and kind of reject the aspects of her upbringing that she didn't like. She also has a lot of tragedy in her backstory. And, you know, a lot of those like painful experiences shaped her into the person that she is, particularly the death of her brother and then the death of uh, her first boyfriend, who was a mage. And I just think her whole backstory with getting involved in the Templars, getting rejected by them, becoming a seeker, and, um, you know, her whole involvement with the Chantry, And wanting to reform the Chantry and make it truly into a force for good. Cassandra is an S-tier character, in my my opinion. I'll slot her just above... um, I'm actually going to put her ahead of Alistair. We're not going to put her ahead of Morgan, but we'll put her ahead of Alistair. Um, One of the better 
characters in the franchise. It took me a few playthroughs of Inquisition to really like come to these conclusions about her, but when you really get the full scope of her backstory and get all of this information about her, she's one of the most dynamic characters in the whole franchise. So next up we have Solus, the bad boy, the dread wolf, the betrayer. Okay, so I feel like there has to be two tier list considerations for Solus. There's uh your personal like towards him or dislike towards him, and then how well written he is as a character. I'm going to look at it more from the aspect of how well written Solus is as a character. When it comes to that, Solus is S tier, undeniably S tier character. Um, I'm going to put him ahead of, oh man, where do I want to slot him on here? I would probably put him, if I was just looking at it from the lens of how well written the character is, I'd put him at number one, number one in the S tier, but I will dock him a little bit because the characters that are above him right now in this list are just more likable than him. Yeah. Solus obviously being Dreadwolf, Fen Harrell has very interesting backstory, which we fully get the picture of in Trespasser. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in Dragon Age 4. He's obviously going to be the main villain in that game. Despite uh, feeling a little bit betrayed by Solus uh, after playing Inquisition, um, I can't help but understand his motives, and I think he's one of the more interesting kind of villain characters in that respect. You know, he feels like Tearing down the veil and, you know, opening the fade to the real world is really the only way to kind of achieve his goals and bring back his people, um, which will obviously have catastrophic results. But he also has, you know, reservations and um, let's say guilt about wanting to do that. And it's going to be interesting to see if they have some sort of redemption arc for Solus in Dragon Age 4. But with the way he's been written up to this point, absolute S-tier character, S-tier writing. It's Solus. He's S-tier, baby. So next up, we have Sarah. Oh, my God. All right. D-tier. D-tier. One of the most annoying characters in the whole franchise. Oh, my God. She's a divisive character. I'm sure some people love Sarah. And I'm sure on some people's list, she might even be S-tier. But for me, she's so childish and annoying and grating. And I don't know. This is a character who I kind of turned on. <laughs> Initially, I didn't have these uh, feelings about her for the most part. But the more I play the game, the more I just see how uh, rigid her thinking is and how little she grows as a character. Which, in a sense, from a writing standpoint... If they were intending that uh, to kind of create a character who's maybe more human in that sense, let's be honest. In real life, lots of people never grow, never change, never improve. <laughs> they stay stuck in their ways and make the same mistakes over and over again. And you kind of see that with Sarah. I There's a cutscene that you can get if you play as a female elf who romances Sarah and then takes uh, drinks from the Well of Sorrows. And just seeing um, how that is a literal deal breaker for her. She's so against elves who are who are wrapped up in like elven legacy that she can't see other perspectives of that. She's so blinded by that. For me, one of the more annoying characters in the franchise. Next up, we got Iron Bull. Iron Bull is one of my favorite characters in this franchise. Um, absolutely love him. You know, he's probably not the most dynamic or interesting overall. You know, especially in terms of just the layers of writing when you compare him to, say, Cassandra or Solus or Liliana. But he has some interesting things in his backstory, um, how he sort of, uh, let's say, got disillusioned with the Kuhn, offered to be re-educated because he was, like, not capable of dealing with the feelings that he was getting with, um, you know, seeing all these like horrible things in, in war, you know, forming his own mercenary gang and the love that he developed for the people that worked for him. And, you know, just all these other aspects of him being just a fun, different side of the Kunari that we never see in the other games, I guess with the exception of Talus, which by the way, I forgot to talk about Talus. She's not on this list. I don't know who made this tier list, by the way. I did not create this original tier list on tier maker. So uh, we're going to talk about Talus in a minute. But yeah, at the end of the day, Iron Bull, one of the most fun characters, one of my favorite characters. And for that reason, top of the S tier, baby, 
I think he might be my favorite of all time, baby. Yeah, Iron Bull's great. S tier for me. Probably one of my favorite companions in the entire trilogy. Next up, we got Vivienne. Um, hmm. Grating, annoying, uh, conniving, not a good person. <laughs> I don't like Vivienne very much. She's um, very judgmental. Always has this like air of superiority and talking down to people like, oh, I'm sorry, dear. It's just, I don't know. I don't like it. I find it to be very annoying. Um, I don't think she's quite as bad as Sebastian for me, but she's a D tier character. Not a huge fan of Vivienne. Next up, we have Blackwall or Tom Rainier. Um, Blackwall is a great character. I like him. Has an interesting backstory in terms of uh, running away from his past, changing his identity, taking on the identity of another man, then owning up to that. Um, you know, really obsessed with the Grey Wardens and the the ideals. I think he's, you know, trying to find himself after doing some despicable things. At the end of the day, you know, makes him makes himself a little bit respectable. So I like Blackwall overall. Um, I'm going to put him in the A tier. We're going to slot him just ahead of Nathaniel Howe. Good character. Probably not the best character of all time, but really, really solid character. Next up, we got Cole. Um, the more I play Dragon Age Inquisition, the more I'm warming up to Cole. I've I've always been a little bit off put by him because he's a spirit and he says all sorts of weird and strange shit. But he's clearly like his heart's in the right place. He's trying to do the right thing. And he clearly wants to help people. Also has a fuckload of Mass Effect references. <laughs> when you go speak to him, he's he's always dropping uh, Mass Effect references in there and other movie references and stuff. Um, so the more I play Inquisition, the more I have come to like Cole as a character. So I'm going to put him in the B tier. I think if I do one more playthrough of Inquisition, he might end up in the A tier. But we're going to put him uh, just ahead of Meryl. Just below Fenris. Um, yeah, solid character overall. All right, next up we've got Dorian. Again, one of my favorite characters in these games. Dorian's a lot of fun. A lot of flair, very flashy, very loyal, and very very much seeking to do good both outside of Tevinter and then hopefully going into Reform Tevinter. So I'm really interested to see what they decide to do with Dorian in Dragon Age 4. Considering the game is set in Tevinter and Dorian now plays an important role, being part of the Magisterium after his father's death, I imagine he's going to be in the game, so I'm curious to see what happens with his character. One of the most likable characters for me in these games. Um, I'm going to put Dorian just ahead of Morrigan. Uh, that's where he's going. He's S tier for me. Dorian's great. Okay, last two are not technically companions, but they play such a big role in Dragon Age Inquisition that they feel like companions. So we got Cullen. Cullen's a great character. You know, obviously he's one of the few characters who shows up in all three Dragon Age games. We really get to see his full character development in Dragon Age Inquisition, uh, with him getting disillusioned with the Templars, leaving the Templars, trying to kick Lyrium to really like totally free himself from that life and devote himself to a cause that he fully believes in, that he's making the choice to do, which is the Inquisition. Uh, I think Colin's a great character. Um, again, one of the more interesting arcs over the course of three games. And because of that, we're going to put him in the A tier. I'm going to slot him just below Bethany. Bethany's too sweet to lose that spot to Colin. Come on. But in any case, yeah, Colin's a solid A tier character for me. Next up, we got Josephine, um, another character I really like. She's got an interesting backstory with her family's kind of declining prospects and how she's trying to sort of like right the ship there and get them back on track. Um, you know, also obviously very well skilled when it comes to navigating the nuances of Orlesian politics or just politics in general becomes a very valuable member of the Inquisition because of that. She's very attuned to courting diplomats and playing the game, so to speak. And, you know, at the end of the day, I really like Josephine. She has a good romance arc as well, if you're interested in that. And I'm going to put her in the A tier. We're going to slot her just below Cullen, I think. Um, she's a character who I'd probably put above Cullen if it weren't for her only appearing in one game. I think seeing Cullen's arc from Origins, DA2, and Inquisition makes me put him above Josephine. But at the end of the day, Josephine's an A-tier character as well. 
So I noticed as I was making this that uh, Talus was actually not included, and Talus is a DLC companion for Dragon Age 2's Mark of the Assassin DLC. Whoever made this tier list forgot to put Talus in there. Shame on you, man. What, have people not played Dragon Age 2's DLC? Come on. I know Dragon Age 2 is not the favorite for most people. Talus is kind of an interesting character. She's an elf who becomes an agent of the Kunari, um, joins the Kune, and, you know, we also get a few, I think, war table operations that involve her in Dragon Age Inquisition, but um, she's a very likable character, and can, things can go a couple of different ways with her depending on the decisions you make in Mark of the Assassin. You get to spend so little time with her that it's it's hard to justify, like, putting her in the A or S tier, but I would say that Talus is a solid B tier character. So let's edit that shit in in post, baby. So there you have it the ultimate Dragon Age companion tier list. Let me know in the comments where you would put some of these companions. I'm sure there's going to be disagreements with me on some of these, but I'm sure some of you also are vibing with this. So if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to Big Dan Gaming for more Mass Effect, Dragon Age, and RPG videos. Also, big shout out to all the channel members for supporting my content. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. I should go.